Well, we will go ahead and get started. I will declare this meeting um, uh, open, and I will read a public charge. We, um, I think one of our commissioners is on her way, I'm sure. So, so the public charge, the Board of Commissioners asks its members and citizens to conduct themselves in a respectful, courteous manner, both with the board and fellow citizens. At any time, should any member of the board or any citizen fail to observe this public charge, the chair will ask the offending person to leave the meeting until that individual regains personal control. Should decorum fail to be restored, the chair will recess the meeting until such time that a genuine commitment to the public charge is observed. If you will stand with me, and um, Mr. Burns, if you will lead us in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the Thank you. Are there, commissioners, are there any agenda, agenda adjustments? Hearing none, I'll move on to announcements, and we will have our clerk, Monica Wallace, will read our announcements for us. Good evening, commissioners and public. I will read the announcements that are located in our agenda for this evening. Uh, the COVID-19 vaccination clinic at the Durham County Department of Public Health is now open for walk-in vaccination doses on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. They're closed from 12 to 1 p.m. daily. The clinic uh, is also closed Tuesdays, Thursdays, and the weekend. Please visit decopublichealth.org backslash COVID vaccines for additional information. Join the Durham County Open Space Program from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. on Saturday, March 25th for the Volunteer Workday at the New Hope Bottomlands Creek, I'm sorry, New Hope Bottomlands Trail to celebrate Creek Week and help beautify our community. We'll meet at Old Chapel Hill Park, Old Chapel Hill Road Park, which is at 3791 Southwest Durham Drive and pick up trash along the trail and New Hope Creek. The trash bags and gloves will be provided. There's a link to RSVP, and for additional information, you can contact David Bradley, uh, the open space specialist at 919-560-0093. The Durham Chapel Hill Carborough Metropolitan Planning Organization, along with Go Triangle, Durham County Government, and Orange County Government is seeking public comment on the fiscal year 2024 transit work program for both Durham and Orange counties. Members of the public can take an online survey. There is a link, or you can also send the information by email to publicinformation at dchcmpo.org. Public comment will be open through March 28th. The 2023-24 application for Durham Pre-K is open and accepting applications for all children who will be four as of August 31st, 2023. You can apply at durhampreK.org or call 1-833-PRE-K-EDU to speak with a bilingual applicant specialist. Residents may also attend the Saturday, March 18th, roll up and enroll in the event to sign up at Leathers Meacham Head Start, located at 908 Liberty Street from 9.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. Durham County staff will host a public input and information session on the National Opioid Settlement on Monday, March 20th from 5.30 p.m. till 7 p.m. The event will be held inside the Commissioner's Chambers and the foyer on the second floor of the Administrative One building. Everyone is invited to come and learn about the $11.6 million in NOS funds, which Durham County will receive over the next 18 years. 
feedback on community priorities on how the Board of County Commissioners will use this funding to address the opioid epidemic, support treatment, recovery, harm reduction, and other life-saving programs and services. There is a link for additional information. The Emily Kays Center Game Plan. College program will be hosting its annual College Expo on Saturday, March 25th at the center from 12 to 3 p.m. The event will feature a college fair with more than 40 colleges and universities represented, workshops led by college ac access experts, and more. The event is free and open to all. Registration is highly encouraged um, because there is seating, uh, limited seating available. Um, there is a link to apply or to register online. Free tax preparation from Tax Aid at Main Library. Need help with your tax preparation? AARP Foundation Tax Aid is offering free tax preparation for taxpayers of all ages with a special emphasis on seniors. Tax Aid staff will be on hand at the Durham County Library located at 300 North Roxborough Street. Mondays and Thursdays from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. through April 13th. Walk-ins are available. Um, please do not contact the library for an appointment. You can email durhamtaxaid at gmail.com. And there's one additional announcement that I did not get a chance to add. Uh, let's see. Durham's uh, Academic Success Alliance is excited to announce dollars and cents finding your financial fit for college. DPS seniors and their families can get help reviewing their financial aid award letters and attend breakout sessions to learn more about financing and preparing for college. The event will take place indoors and masks are strongly encouraged. It will be held at the W.G. Pearson Center located at 600 East Umstead Street on Saturday, March 18th. Um, it will begin at 10 a.m. and run until 1 p.m. The event is free and open to all community members. Chair Howerton, that concludes the announcements um, in tonight's agenda. Thank you, Ms. Wallace, for reading those announcements for us. Are there any other announcements from the board? Chair Jacobs. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have one additional announcement, which is hot off the press. <laughs> Um, and I will email it out to our entire board as well and to um, a lot of our staff. This is for a dementia, a Durham dementia community event that is going to be on Saturday, April 29th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at our Health and Human Services building. And it is, it is called Creating an Inclusive Community of Understanding advocacy and support and it is free to everyone lunch will be provided um it is it's going to be uh there's going to be a panel discussion breakout sessions but it's also going to be um it's going to be a lot of fun in certain ways as well um and it, it is for anyone who is living with dementia caring for someone with dementia or who just wishes to learn more, and the keynote address is from Jay Reinstein, who used to be one of our um, city deputy managers. Um, many of you probably know Jay, and he is going to speaking be speaking on living well with early onset dementia. So um, excited to um, share this event, and I will get it to you, Monica, as well. Thank you. I, mine will be relatively quick. Um, there, there are only two. One of them is actually on our Facebook page, but I do hope that we send it out pretty widely. So Durham Tech is doing an information session this week. One of the events was today. The other ones will be on the 16th and the 17th. Uh, if you know people in the community who are looking how, looking forward to pivoting in the pandemic, looking for their next career, Durham Tech is an awesome option. Uh, they will be doing listening sessions on software development, entrepreneurship, and Every community college in North Carolina right now is essentially free. It just is with the influx of dollars that we got for ARPA. So this is the great time to go take a class, pick an associate's degree for low to no cost. I know we talk a lot about the Bulls Initiative, but I also think we have an awesome opportunity in this community 
for folks who are not going into those industries to go to Durham Tech and pick something else up. The other one I wanted to bring up, um, I, some folks in the community have reached out to me about this one. I want to thank Commissioner Carter last week for, uh, and, and others in the room who highlighted um, House Bill, help me tell the truth, Commissioner Carter, last week, last week um, uh, about how um, we really are seeing our children being attacked in Durham Public Schools right now and, and statewide. So tomorrow, the Education Committee at the North Carolina General Assembly will be voting on House Bill 187. It is actually called the Education Equity Act. It is not an Education Equity Act. It has everything to do uh, with making sure that we don't teach slavery in schools. Uh, they're making this argument about critical race theory, which we don't teach in schools. Um, they're making arguments about how we make certain children feel bad when we talk about the civil rights movement. So this was filed in February, but they actually are voting on it tomorrow. This is the same group of uh, representatives and senators that made up a Facebook page of each of our school board members, put their faces, their addresses, and their home phone numbers on it. So this is a group of people who are hit bent on attacking progressive school board members. So I do want us to watch this legislation, much like we've been watching the LGBTQ legislation, and make sure that our elected officials on all bodies, including our school board, and that our students are taught in fair, equal learning environments. So again, I hope we're all watching House Bill 187, and also let's make sure that we can fill up the seats at Durham Tech. Thank you. Commissioner Alum. Thank you, Chair Howerton. Glad to be back in our Welcome chambers. back. Thank you. Um, I had a very quick one. I just wanted to give everyone an update that Ramadan is starting next Wednesday, uh, March 23rd. So for everyone to know that this is the uh, holy month of Ramadan of fasting for Muslims. So for all of our county staff that are going to be fasting, um, please be courteous to them as we will be hungry and thirsty throughout the day. And especially to our students who are going to be fasting uh, during the school days. Uh, to all of our staff to just be, and our DPS staff to be just a little courteous to them as they will be going through that and focusing in school at the same time. And I look forward to celebrating and sharing these celebrations with each of you during this month. Okay, anything else? All right. So I just want to say in the announcements when we talked about our uh, opioid dollars, I wrote down beside it, money, money, money. Um, it's a shame that we have to get money, money, money this way, and because that means that people lost their lives, but it will be money that Durham County can help others that did not lose their lives. But we've got a lot of work to do to, get, to be able to give that money out. Yeah. So we'll, let's move on to our minutes. We have minutes um, for September, February. I'm going to September. February 27th, our regular session. Uh, do, are there any edits on those minutes? If not, can I get a motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And it has been moved and approved. Now we are down to our ceremonial items. Uh, the first one is 23-0183, Proclamation 2023 as Year of the Trail in North Carolina. The board is requested to proclaim 2023 as the year of the trail in Durham, North Carolina. And I will ask Commissioner Jacobs if she will read the proclamation and ask Jane Kors um, if she will come to the podium to accept that. Is she here? Yes. She's not here. It's like we have Brendan Moore. Okay. <laughs> read that for us. Durham Board of County Commissioners, Proclamation Year of the Trail 2023. Whereas Durham County's natural beauty and access to recreation are critical to its residents' quality of life, health, and economic well being. Whereas Durham County's natural assets and resources are integral to dis disaster recovery and resiliency to climate change for future generations. And whereas Durham County's nature 
Preserves and partnership parks are welcoming to all and provide a common ground for people of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds to access our rich and diverse natural, cultural, and historic resources. And whereas trails offer quality of life benefits to all as expressions of local community character and pride, as outdoor workshops for science education, as tools for economic revitalization, as free resources for healthy recreation, as accessible alternative transportation, and as sites for social and cultural events. Whereas Durham County provides foot and mountain biking trails within our nature preserves that are an integral part of our county's outdoor recreational opportunities and promote an appreciation of Durham's natural resources by residents and visitors, including 20 miles of natural surface trails and biking trails at Hollow Rock Park, Little River Regional Park, and New Hope Preserve. And whereas Durham County supports several significant regional trails, including the East Coast Greenway that stretches 3,000 miles from Maine to Florida, connecting Durham to 450 cities and towns and 15 states, and the Mountains to Sea Trail that stretches across North Carolina for more than 1,000 miles from mountains to coast. And whereas North Carolina is known as the Great Trail State, and whereas the North Carolina General Assembly designated 2023 as the Year of the Trail in North Carolina to promote and celebrate the state's extensive network of trails that showcase our state's beauty, vibrancy, and cu culture. And whereas Durham County will host or participate with our partners in several events during 2023, that will highlight and celebrate trails in Durham County. Now, therefore, be it resolved, I, Brenda Howerton, Chair of the Durham Board of County Commissioners, and on behalf of the Durham Board of County Commissioners, do hereby proclaim 2023 as the year of the trail in Durham County, North Carolina, this 13th day of March, 2023. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Commissioners. All of us uh, at the Durham County Open Space Program are very excited about this year of the trail. It really gives us the opportunity to showcase the diverse natural beauty and uh, at our parks and our nature preserves. We're very grateful for your continued support of the program in preserving Durham's unique natural. We will be offering numerous events throughout the year to celebrate the year of the trail. We hope everyone can come out and take part in at least one of them, starting, uh, as the announcement said earlier, on March 25th, we'll have a cleanup day uh, as part of Creek Week, um, the New Hope Creek Bottomlands Trail. We'll also be hosting a invasive species removal for World Biodiversity Day on May 20th. On June 3rd, we'll be hosting a guided hike at Little River Regional Park as part of National Trails Day. Uh, in September 23rd is National Public Lands Day. We'll be doing some uh, trail renovations again at New Hope Creek. Uh, Bottomlands Trail. And on November 17th, on Take a Hike Day, we'll be doing a guided hike at Hollow Rock Park. So lots of events to look forward to. And uh, the, the North Carolina Trails, the Year of the Trails website also has a full list of activities throughout the state to part in and celebrate. So thank you very much. Thank you. Would you repeat your name and address for the record, please? And address, did you say? Your, your name and address for the clerk, please. Brendan Moore, Nine Governors Place. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm? He still need to say his. You still need to say his name. <laughs> Sorry, so that she has it on record. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any commissioners? Yeah. Brendan, don't go away. <laughs> yeah. He's just. He's just running. <laughs> Uh, well, Brandon, first of all, I want to acknowledge you as somebody who has spent countless hours helping to maintain our trails. Um, I, I know that's you have 
done that over many years, actually going out and, and, and doing that really hard work um, that has to be done. So thank you for your role in, in our trail system. And I really love that you are, that we are going to be highlighting each of the um, parks that the county is a part of and the trails. And just wondering, are you going to, is there going to be a flyer or something? Or Yes, you'll we're be... going to be putting out signs at all the parks as well as advertising it on our website and on our social media. Okay, great. Um, and I also wanted to note that another way that Durham County supports our trails is through the Durham Open Space and Trails um, Commission because I, in the past week, have run into Delphine Sellers and her sister at different events, and they reminded me that our most recent grant to you can um, that the Catawba Trails is that they are going to be building new trails out in in that part of the county. Um, so that's another way that we're we are helping to support trails in our community. But uh, um, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nolam. Yes. Um... Thank you so much for being here, and I'm really excited to be the liaison for the Open Space and Trails Commission. This group of folks uh, on our commission is probably one of the most dedicated group of peoples of any of the boards that I have the honor of serving on, so I'm really excited for us to go back at our next meeting. Uh, Jane is our staff liaison from the county side who's been absolutely amazing in making sure we have the resources on Open Space and Trails, and Dave Conley, if any of you have met our chair of our board, he is the most passionate person about open space and trails I have ever met. And we, I'm really excited about, you know, one thing, as Wendy mentioned, for this board that's really great, that's different from the other boards I serve on, is that we provide grants uh, to the community. So if there's individuals within the community who have open space areas that they want to see improvements to, come to your open space and trails commission meetings. Uh, and learn about how to apply for these grants because we're constantly looking for uh, folks to support improving their own communities and neighborhoods. So I'm really excited to be celebrating this this year. Thank you. Commissioner Carter. I wanted to thank Brandon, too. I, I'm very excited to hear about the list of uh, ways in which we're active participants in the Year of the Trail. That's going to be um, really fun to join in on many of the events. And thank you for planning those. Um, and I also just wanted to, to mention what a amenity the trails are in Durham. They really do improve our quality of life in so many ways. They connect us to nature. They connect us to each other. Um, they, you know, Im improve our health, both physical health, mental health, or economic engines. They, you know, they can drive economic development in many ways. Um, and I just, I wanted to say, I feel really fortunate that I live very close to trails and I use them every single day. And I, my, it's my hope that all of our neighborhoods in Durham will, it, it, you know, eventually have easy access to, to trails in the same way that I do. It really makes a difference in my life and I'd like for that to be available and accessible easily to everyone in Durham. And I know we're working towards that end in partnership with the city. Thank you. So now you have to come up with a challenge for the commissioners to be on the trail. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. So our next um, resolution, 230189, Gives me great pleasure. Uh, this is a resolution honoring the retirement of the Honorable U.S. Congressman David E. Price. The board is requested to approve the resolution honoring the extraordinary service of a longtime Fourth District Congressman David Price. And I will read the resolution. And then we'll have Congressman Price go to the podium. And after that, we'll have you come forward, accept the flag that we have here, and take some pictures of that. It's okay with you. 
So the resolution states, Honorable U.S. Representative David Eugene Price, whereas this Tennessee native received his formal education first at Mars Hill University, then transferred to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he earned a BA degree in history and mathematics, and then to Yale University, where he earned a Bachelor of Divinity degree and a PhD in political science. And whereas David Price was first elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1986 to serve the North Carolina's 4th Congressional District. And whereas Price worked for the North Carolina Democratic Party, serving as its executive director and eventually the state chair prior to his election to Congress. And whereas he represented North Carolina for a total of 34 years, doing two separate terms of service from 1986 to 1994, and again from 1996 until his retirement in 2022. And whereas during his congressional service, he was highly regarded for his leadership, including his work as chairman of the Transportation and Housing Appropriations Subcommittee, along with service on the House Budget Committee and the Appropriations Subcommittee for Homeland Security and more. And whereas throughout his tenure, he courageously fought to enact legislation and policies centered around helping the least among us and work to level, to level the playing field for those without an effective voice. And whereas one only needs to drive through the Research Triangle Park region to witness the impact of his public service, which brought substantial federal funding for infrastructure projects, job training, airport upgrades, economic development expansions, and more. And whereas in his final term of office, Representative Price ensured that the 4th District received 30, $35.9 million in community project funding and that Durham County residents received $700,000 for Hey Tyree Bourne to bring a coordinated effort to reduce community violence through methods such as educational programming, reentry services, and mentorship opportunities, along with 750,000 for Ross Road apartments to redevelop distressed housing into quality multi-bedroom apartments to serve low and very low income households, including supportive housing for formerly unhoused individuals and families. And whereas Representative Price will long be celebrated for demonstrating diversified skills and abilities, critical thinking through negotiations and strategic planning efforts that helped him effectively maneuver the many complexities of successfully operating in Congress for many years. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the members of the Board of County Commissioners, do hereby resolve to express our most sincere and deepest appreciation to U.S. Representative David Eugene Price for his passion, advocacy, and productivity representing the residents of the 4th District for 34 years with distinction. Be it also resolved that we call upon all citizens of Durham County to salute, command, and applaud him on his retirement from a productive, dedicated career of public service, and be it further resolved that we wish him much joy and happiness as he commences a productive, a new career journey in his life. 
this the 13th day of March 22, Board of County Commissioners. Thank you, Madam Chair. May I say a few words? Absolutely. As well, as I like. appreciate the uh, recognition tonight more than I can say. And uh, looking around the table at these, uh, your fellow commissioners, you and your, your fellow commissioners, all of whom serve selflessly in the, in the public interest, I do appreciate this recognition coming from this board, which uh, it's been a pleasure to work with and which I have high respect, high esteem for uh, the work that you do uh, every day. Um, 34 years is a long time. Most of those years, uh, I represented all or part of Durham County. Other times, as you know, I uh, very uh, cooperatively shared the representation with G.K. Butterfield and other, other, other colleagues. Um, but I do remember, I do remember the year when Durham County was first drawn into the 4th District. It had not historically been that way. But in the mid-90s, um, sure enough, the map was redrawn in response to court orders, and uh, Durham was placed in the 4th District. And uh, that, was a, uh, that was a blessing, but it was also a challenge. It was, it was uh, this community that I, that I knew well. I lived nearby. I taught at Duke University. I had been involved in community affairs here. But that's, that's one thing. It's another thing to actually represent the community in uh, so uh, we, we had a time when we were uh, getting better acquainted. And uh, a woman is here tonight who uh, was very, very instrumental in my making that transition, Tracy Lovett, who uh, <clears throat> had served uh, Congressman Mel Watt when he, when he represented Durham. And then he uh, graciously agreed to uh, work with me as we uh, adopted this new territory. And, and I just have to say, I have never in politics been more warmly welcomed, felt more of a, of a willingness to, uh, to, to cooperate and, and, and work together than I received in Durham County. And I'll always be grateful for that because I was apprehensive about it. Didn't know how it would go. Turned out it went beautifully as far as I'm concerned. And I hope uh, the county feels the same way. It, just tonight that maybe uh, maybe you do, and that we have had a, a very fruitful partnership, which we all recognize, and and we hope will be a, a model for uh, your new representative and and her relationship with you, uh, Congresswoman Valerie Fushi, who uh, I was with yesterday and who is doing a great job in uh, taking on the uh, the role that uh, I had for for these many years. Uh, you did uh, you were you were nice to mention some of these uh, community projects. But you know, speaking of trails, let's let's not forget there is a trail in that uh, in that list as well, um, and we we got it done just this year, the um, city of Durham, the R. Kelly Bryant Bridge Trail. Mm -hmm. So uh, that joins the the pattern of trails, and I couldn't agree more that those are real amenities for this uh, community. There's affordable housing here. There is uh, there is outreach to uh, disadvantaged communities, as you say. And uh, this board, of course, formulated much of this. This board and the, and the county staff, as well as the city board and the city staff, uh, helped formulate these projects. And that's another example of, of, of the kind of cooperative effort that we've engaged in. So it's a great community. I don't think there's any community anywhere that I, that I know of that has more of a capacity to, uh, to help itself. You know, this, this, this community is just full of individuals and groups that uh, want to make the community better, want this to be an inclusive community, and, and work to make it that way. That means going after federal funds? Yes, that's what it means. But it means so much more than that. It means a, a kind of quality of citizenship that takes on a responsibility for the good of all, for the common good. That's how it works in a democracy, and you make democracy work uh, wonderfully well. It's a pleasure to work with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can't, you can't go. You can't go nowhere yet. You can't go yet.
<laughs> so, Tracy, would you like to have a comment? Well, let me just say Durham is home, and it has been a pleasure working with Congressman David Price. We, um, we share a birthday, so we also have <laughs> what we call our national holiday. Um, <laughs> but it, it really has been an honor to work in the district that I live in, uh, work for a person that, has, that really has uh, citizenry at heart. He really cares about the community, the people that he represents. He's a very thoughtful person. Um, and I couldn't be more blessed than to work for a wonderful person like Congressman. So, in a town that I love. So, thank you all. Thank you. Commissioners? We'll start over here, Commissioner. Uh, alone. Thank you, Chair Horton. I think it's uh, no secret, Congressman Price, that you are someone I look up to and admire a lot. I'm just so appreciative of all of the work you've done for our community. And this, this resolution, though it highlights amazing things you've done, it nearly is not close to everything you have done for uh, the 4th Congressional District. And if I may just highlight, Madam Chair, like a few items that are very personal to me that really made you stand out as an exceptional leader for this district. Um, one, starting with, I have never had seen a representative anywhere in the country who has done the type of service and community engagement that you have. Of, I remember being able to just go to coffee shops and you would have coffee conversations and just being able to go to a coffee shop and sit and ask my congressman questions about what's happening in D.C. And you would stay there till the very last person was able to come up to you and ask that question. So thank you for that level of engagement. And something that a lot of people don't know and realize that's very personal is that after the death of Dia Yosan Rezan, Congressman Price was one of the only, if if not the only uh, elected official who actually recognized their murders as a hate crime and reached out to the families and the friends of the Ayos and Razan. And that meant so much to us, especially in a time where we felt so alone, uh, that you were there for us. And not just in the public sphere, but even when we had fundraisers for their endowment and the scholarships created in their names, you and Lisa would come. And you guys also contributed every single time, which just means so much to us and our community to have had you in that place and to have supported our community when we were alone. So just thank you so much for everything you've done. Commissioner Carter. Those were beautiful remarks, Netta. Thank you for those. And, and I just want to express my admiration for you, Congressman Price, and also uh, to acknowledge what a public servant, true public servant and role model you are for all of us. Um, you clearly have worked on all of the issues that I think are very important to this board, transportation, education, housing, and more. You're a real social scientist and have um, championed the cause in, in so many different ways. And you've been successful at um, getting the work done, working across um, political lines and ideologies and been able to to actually get legislation approved and um, we appreciate that and it's not hard it, it's very hard to do um, and I did have one question for you I do not know how anyone could have endured 18 campaigns 17 of which were successful how did you ever endure you, you must be a man of real fortitude in many ways <laughs> to be able to to, to to have the stamina for that. Well, I ask myself the same question <laughs> sometimes. Uh, we, uh, one at a time, some are more fun than others. Uh, I, uh, I remember um, basically fondly, though, positively, uh, the, the campaigns. Not, not the fundraising, not every aspect of it, certainly not the attack ads. 
But my wife used to say that she loved politics because of the camaraderie and the cause. And that, uh, that's the way I feel, too. There is, um, I don't know, any, anything in our community that brings us together like uh, politics does. It also drives us apart sometimes. But my uh, friends and associates and colleagues in, uh, in the Democratic Party and also across the aisle have, uh, have been a, uh, a diverse set of citizens, all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of points of view. And politics at its best brings us together in equality and mutual respect. And I do think many times we've been able to maintain that in this community and across this. So, uh, I, uh, you're right, there was one campaign I'd just as soon forget. But uh, <laughs> basically, they've been experiences that, uh, that bring us, uh, that have brought me in close touch with people in this district. And I hope I've uh, communicated what I hope. By the, by the way, I'll just add one thing. You know, campaign, we shouldn't resent having to campaign. I hope we all feel that way. I expect we do. You know, it, it sometimes seems like it comes very often, and we certainly don't like some aspects of it. But we do need to give an account of ourselves. And citizens need to have a way to organize and, and, and say what they want and make some uh, make demands. and. Uh, demand accountability. So I, I think um, in a democratic system, campaigns uh, have a really important function. And so I've tried to run good, honorable campaigns. That's a great answer. Thank you for humoring me on that. And, and um, I, I admire your wisdom and uh, your impact and influence and leadership will be missed. Manager? Well, I will just say, Congressman Price, we only had a brief time together, but I will tell you, I quickly learned how highly dedicated and committed you are to serving the people that you represent. And I was just really impressed with how willing you were to sit down with us, to hear about our community's needs, and then to also help us, you know, think through the strategies of how to resolve some of the issues we had. And I'm just impressed and blown away by that. I've never seen that before. So thank you so much for to Commissioner Alum's comments, the, the level of engagement that you have demonstrated through your time. We will miss you tremendously, but I wish you so much success in your next chapter. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Congressman Price, it's hard to believe that you are actually <laughs> retiring. I mean, and of course, it's fitting that you aren't really retiring because you're going back to Duke University, um, which is, I think, totally fitting because it's hard to imagine you not not continue to be engaged. Um, I, I can really only just add examples to um, what everybody has said about you. Um, um, I think that you really embody um, what our democracy is all about. Um, your passion for the work just comes through, um, how much you just really have loved every aspect of the work. And um, I will say I was a Duke student when you were at Duke. I did not, I missed out on taking your class. Um, but one of my earliest memories with you was when in, the, in the 90s, it was probably in the mid-90s, and my children were very young. I had two, two children at that point under age five, and I remember going to your headquarters, I think it was on University Drive, um, and you were having a campaign event, and I worked on your campaign with two, my two little children in tow, um, and then um, around that time also, and this just really, to me, also embodies the person that you are that really shines through. Um, we were driving to the Ena River Festival and had a problem with a bike coming off our car, and we pulled over to the side of the road, and you stopped and helped us get the bike on our car, and you didn't even say who you were. We knew who you were, but you did not even identify yourself, <laughs> and then we saw you speaking at the Eno Festival afterwards, but that's just typical of you not even an act of kindness and helping other people and not wanting to take any, any credit for it whatsoever. 
And for me, one of the highlights for me in my career was getting to work with you on the light rail. And you worked as hard as you could. You fought as hard as you could uh, with uh, Congressman Butterfield. And I remember one night having a conversation with you. You were in Switzerland. Anytime I called you or texted you, you answered the phone no matter what. Um, and you just have worked tirelessly, tirelessly for our community. Uh, I'm just so grateful uh, for everything that you've done for us and thinking of you coming to at our speaking every year at our Martin Luther King um, services, even when you weren't representing Durham County, you still made a point of coming to Durham um, and speaking at those services. Um, so I just wish you good health and uh, enjoying this last this this new phase of your life, um, going back to your roots uh, as a professor, and um, hope that we continue uh, to see you and and be able to work with you in our community. Thank you. And Tracy, I don't want to leave you out because you you have been a team. I don't think I've ever seen anybody be a team the way the two of you have been and all that you have done for Durham as well. We, we've been so lucky to have you as well as a part of our community. Thank you so much for everything. Senator Burns. Hello, Congressman Price. How you doing? Uh, I'll, <clears throat> I'll be quick. I just want to, I want to take some time to say thank you. I, much like Commissioner Alam, I think that there's a lot that you've done for the community that folks in here just would not know about, you know, any other way. You know, I look out in the audience, I look out in the community, and I think about these people um, who like to profit off the pain of poor people. Uh, I think about full allyship. And then I think about you, and that's never been the case. There are so many times when you entered into spaces to support people who look like me, who look like Commissioner Alam, and you were not there for the limelight. You were not there to take pictures. You really were there, you know, to be very solution-oriented. When I was first elected, you know, I didn't know if I was going to be able to just, you know, call you on the phone like I called other people. You took my calls. You took that early on a Saturday morning. I think you called me before I woke up. Uh, so I appreciate that. Um, much like Commissioner uh, Jacob said, I can't believe after 34 years, you know, I think a lot of young people say, I, I would rest. Nope. You said, I'm going back to do. I'm going back to teach. I should not be surprised because I remember uh, two Fourth of July's where we had to march in the parade. And I didn't, I won't assume that you were going to walk slower. I just said, I'm going to walk with Congressman Price because I have on heels. Y'all, he left me in the dust. He was carrying a whole flag and something else. And I said, I'll, Tracy, I'll see him at the finish line about this conversation. I, I can't keep up. And so I clearly everything that you've been doing. But one of the things we didn't mention, you know, you stated two things yesterday. For those of you all who were not there, he had a wonderful file side chat with his his current successor, um, uh, now Congresswoman Fushi, and he was peppered with questions. And one of the beautiful things is he did what he always does. He not only answered the questions, but he offered so solutions. So I'm sitting on the second row, you know, taking copious notes. And I did what I could always do. I could connect people with those opportunities like immediately after myself, along with Deidrana Freeman. We reached out to like five pastors about two of the solutions uh, that you gave us. And so just that type of um, you still have that very giving spirit. You're still very learning and you want to share it out with young people. Do not be surprised if I come and audit your class. I don't know if Dr. Price will kick me out. You also mentioned your fight for the EPA. We are really proud of ourselves here in Durham, you know, about the fact that we get 60 to 70 percent of all bio, pharma, and life science um, our opportunities and jobs. I personally feel like, and I would argue it down with anybody, that the EPA has been a force multiplier for that. So your eight-year fight to get the EPA here in the triangle has really done, I don't think we'll ever be able to, we'll ever be able to categorize how much it has done for economic development in this region. So I, I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you for showing up, Tracy. Uh, thank you for showing up. I also want to thank you both for the, the selfless handoff that you did and the selfless handoff that you did with Salima. That does not happen um, in every space. And also, last thing, uh, we can sit here and talk about your, your leadership role on transportation appropriations. North Carolina's congressmen and women in the Democratic Party don't always end up in leadership. And yes, it was transportation, but we cannot sit here and pretend 
Like you did not go into those other committee rooms and make sure that you advocated for dorm rooms at Central, for roads here in Durham. So thank you for the investments that you made, things that people cannot find on a Wikipedia page. They can't find on a Google spreadsheet. They can only find them in the halls and small rooms with conversations like Dr. Lavonia Allison and Representative Michelle and Larry Hall. And I just want you to know that there are people who will still continue to make sure that folks know how much of a sacrifice you made, how much you advocated for Durham, both in the halls of leadership and here uh, at home. So thank you, sir. And I know you're tired uh, standing there listening, but I just want, you know, it's nothing I can, more I can add to this except for this. Congressman Price, when I first moved to Durham, the wind beneath your wings, the, wing, the wind beneath your wings, Lisa, for me. I get to meet your beautiful wife. I met her in her fight around um, the right to carry guns and carry them safely. And we met in Raleigh. Um, we were lining up shoes for the deaths of people that had lost their lives through gun violence. And I will never forget that day um, and meeting her and over the years, just knowing her and knowing you, the passion and the compassion that you have for people and that she had is the only thing I'd like to lift up tonight other than what everybody's already said. And now if you will come and we'll give you this back unless you've, unless you've got something else you'd like to say. Okay, so we will continue. <laughs> so there's one proclamation, um, commissioners, that's not listed, and we have to, we need to acknowledge today the month is Women's Month. So, you know, if we, if we pulled up documents, if we go Google about the contributions 
that women have made to this country, the list would be so long we would not be able to get through the names. So this is uh, an honor for all women, history that have made significant differences to this country and continue to make differences every day in leadership in every way. So I'd like each of, of us to read a way as on this um, proclamation. And I think the first one will, if Burn, uh, Commissioner Burns, if you will start us. <clears throat> Durham Board of County Commissioners Proclamation, Women's History Month 2023. Whereas Women's History Month, we celebrate the countless women who have fought tirelessly and courageously for equality, justice, and opportunity in our nation. We also affirm our commitment to advancing rights and opportunities for women and girls in the United States and around the world. We are mindful that we are building on the legacy of both recognized trailblazers and unsung heroines who have guided the course of American history and continue to shape its future. And. Whereas the full participation of women is a foundational tenet of democracy, women, often women of color, have been on the front lines, fighting for and securing equal rights and opportunity throughout our country's history. As abolitionists, Civil rights leaders, suffragists, and labor activists, women continue to lead as advocates for reproductive rights, champions of racial justice, and LGBTQI plus equality. And whereas, despite significant progress, women and girls continue to face systemic barriers to full and equal participation in our economy and society. Last year, the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, stripping away a constitutional right from the American people and the ability of millions of women to make decisions about their own bodies, putting their health and lives at risk. Disparities persist in economic security, health care, and caregiving responsibilities, especially for women and girls of color. Those who perform critical work, including those who care for our children and our families, are too often overlooked, underpaid, and undervalued. And whereas this month, as we continue our work to advance gender equal equity and equality, let us celebrate the contributions of women throughout our history and honor the stories that have too often gone untold. Let us recognize the fundamental freedoms that fundamental freedoms are interconnected. When opportunities for women are withheld, we all suffer. And when women's lives are improved, we all gain. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Brenda Howerton, Chair of the Board of Commissioners, and on behalf of the Board of County Commissioners, do hereby proclaim March 2023 as Women's History Month in Durham County, North Carolina. Throughout history, women have open the doors of opportunity for subsequent generations and dreamers and doers. As community leaders, educators, doctors, scientists, child care providers, and more, women power our economy and lead our nation and country. I call upon residents of Durham to observe this month and to celebrate women this day and all days, the 13th day of March, 2023. Commissioners. Comments? All right. We'll move on to our consent agenda, and about our manager read through those, or are there any that needs to be pulled? Hearing none, I'll ask for a motion. 
Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we approve, approve tonight's consent agenda in its entirety. Oh, it's been moved and properly second to approve the consent agenda. All in favor? Aye. 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 It, the consent agenda has been approved five to zero. Madam Chair, I just had one comment. I, I, I actually did, I asked the manager to comment on one com item that was not on our work session that was something new, uh, the item related to the software for the Agile software for our fleet which was really thrilling to see that. Um, or are you, or? It was 23-0188. Yeah, 0188. Um, just wanted, I don't know if you wanted to comment oh, on that. It just, it's exciting to see that. Thank you. I will just say one of the things that um, we're really looking to do moving forward is to right size what we're doing operationally and so this piece of hardware will help us to do that with our fleet to make sure that we're utilizing fleet as efficiently as we can. Hello. <laughs> um, we we will be acquiring the software as well as a kiosk to be able to allow departments to actually have access to the vehicles vehicle keys at the Roxburgh deck, so that'll be convenient to those who are downtown. Um, that's the temporary location after the Roxburgh deck is um, there. They are doing some construction on the Roxburgh deck to deal with some of the structural issues. That's where we'll function from. Thank you, Mo. I just want to commend you and your staff for implementing our policy of uh, Fleet management and environmental sustainability. Thank you. Okay, so our next item, commissioners, is a public hearing on uh, number 723 uh, 0181 is a public hearing. Is only map. So the board is requested to conduct a hearing and receive comments. Um, if you have staff, okay. Is this Alexandria? Yes, Alexander Cahill. Okay. A senior planning director is here to go over this item with us. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Chair Howerton, Vice Chair Jacobs, and Honorable Commissioners. Uh, I'm Alexander Cahill with the City County Planning Department. I'm happy to be here with you tonight. Uh, before we begin, staff does want to let you know that all Planning Department hearing items have been advertised and noticed in accordance with local and state law, and affidavits for all these notices are available on file with the Planning Department. Caitlin Kemsky proposes to change the zoning designation of one parcel of land that she owns, totaling around 22 and a half acres and located at 220 and 214 Riley Road. The current zoning is residential rural with a development plan that limits the existing development to a disc golf course. Caitlin is proposing to change this designation to residential rural without that limitation. The properties are currently designated low density residential, which is four dwelling units an acre or less on the future land use map. This proposed rezoning is consistent with that future land use designation. The Planning Commission recommended approval by a vote of 12 to 0 at their January 10th, 2023 meeting. Two motions are required to approve this zoning map change this evening. The first is to approve the ordinance, and the second is to approve a consistency statement. Uh, staff is available to answer any questions, and I believe Ms. Kemsky is available virtually to answer any questions as well. Hear none. I will open the public hearing. Uh, do we have anyone signed up to speak? We do not have anyone signed up to speak. No one signed up to speak. I will close the public hearing and bring it back forward. 
I'm, I'm sorry, Chair Howerton. We did have a resident raise their hand. If you would give me a moment to bring them up. I can't hear you. We had a resident to raise their hand. Online. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? I want to speak up a little bit louder. Yes, uh, this is Mr. Milstead. I am Ms. Kempsky's husband. Um, I just wanted to state that, uh, you know, we just, we just want to build a house on this land. Um, the only provision as mentioned by uh, the planning committee is we just want to remove this provision of the disc golf course. Um, that's my only statement for tonight. Thank you, City Council. Thank you. Okay. Um, anyone else? Hearing none, I'll, I will close the public hearing, bring it back forward. And um, are there any comments? Support? Mr. Jacobs? I want to say I remember when we actually rezoned this property for a disc golf. Uh, it was, I think, in my first term of office. Obviously, it never turned into a disc golf course, <laughs> um, which uh, I'm sorry that didn't actually happen. Um, but um, I, I just wanted to note that the um, that the land use is consistent with the future land use map. And there could be 22 homes there, which would still be consistent with the adjacent um, land use. So I'm, I don't see any issues with this rezoning request. Commissioners, we have before us two motions um, that I would entertain. Motion one is to adopt an ordinance amending the Unified Development Ordinance. In out of the residential school with a development plan, Falls Jordan District B, FJB, and establishing the same as residential rule, Falls Jordan District B, FJB. So moved. Second. Aye. Aye. This is unanimous. It's to adopt the appropriate statement of pursuit to the NCGS 160D 605. Uh, I'd move to adopt the second motion as stated. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That's zero. And then the Another public hearing, 23-0182, zoning map change, Blanchard property, uh, Z2200046. Board is requested to conduct a public hearing and receive public comments on zoning map change, Blanchard, Blanchard property, and approve motions. as well. Hey, good evening. Yes, still Alexander Cahill, still with the planning department, as far as I know. Um, All right. Randy Herman of BA Folk PLCC proposes to change the zoning designation of one parcel of land totaling around three acres located at the 2900 block of US Highway 70 East. The current zoning is residential rural and commercial general. It's a split zoning site. The applicant proposes to change this designation just to be entirely commercial general. The applicant is proposing to rezone the properties to facilitate future commercial development. This development is unknown or unspecified at this time. The properties are currently designated commercial on the future land use map. The proposed commercial general zoning is consistent with this junior land use map designation. The Planning Commission again recommended approval by a vote of 12 to 0 at their January 10th, 2023 meeting. 
There are two motions, again, for this item to approve tonight. The first is to approve the zoning map change, and the second is to adopt a consistency statement. Uh, staff and the applicant are available tonight to answer any questions. Any questions for staff? Um, I have some questions for staff. Yeah, um, so if this is going to be rezoned for commercial and it's not within, it does not have access to city utilities, how would that work? Uh, thank you, Vice Chair, Vice Chair Jacobs. That's a great question. Um, so they, that, they would have to more than likely annex into the city to support any sort of intense commercial use. Um, to have city water and sewer. They, they wouldn't be able to be on city water and sewer. I can't imagine well and septic could support any sort of intense commercial uses, uh, but they may be able to support something very light. Okay, well, I'll, I, I will wait to ask that of the applicant, but that is a concern to me because um, I, I'm just wondering if this is kind of a way to avoid doing a rezoning with the city um, because I, I guess I don't really understand. And so if we if we do the rezoning and then they don't have to go to, to have a rezoning for the city. Um, so anyway, I, I just it just raises some questions for me about this process. Um, and I also there there was a question there was a comment on the staff report that said something about the courage to address uh, bike pad improvements. Could you talk about that a little bit more? Absolutely. So Bike and Pedestrian Commission comments are advisory in nature. Um, staff highly encourage applicants to address those comments. However, there is no associated development plan, either textual or graphic. Um, as you may remember, that development plan revisions was approved by y'all recently. Um, so the applicant could propose a text Textual development plan and commit to some of those recommendations, uh, but because there is no associated development plan, they can't commit to anything um, at this time. There's no mechanism for that. But you can do a text only development plan. Correct. Uh -huh. So that that is an option for the applicant. Okay. And if this went directly to the city for rezoning, um, what, how would the process differ, and what would the standards perhaps be like that they don't have to because they're doing it this way? Yeah, thank you for that question, uh, Vice Chair Jacobs. So same process in terms of go to Planning Commission, uh, but then it would go to City Council instead, and the corollary process would be the annexation, and an annexation is an assessment. There's a fiscal assessment to ensure that it has a cost-benefit analysis done to ensure that it's uh, revenue positive for the city. There's also an operational assessment, so different departments look at annexations to see if there's any operational impact on their departments. Um, and it would go through that process, and then it would be voted on in a consolidated manner, so the council would vote on the annexation and rezone. Okay. Um, and I, I guess I have, it, this is, I think, maybe the first time that we've well, whatever, I'm reading the staff report, and I would just like to comment on the section related to educational impact um, that was in section E. Um, and I, I noticed this when I looked at some of the rezonings that have been sent to us um, for courtesy uh, that are going directly to the city. and. I would like to, you know, just note that by just mentioning the number of new students um, and looking at capacity <clears throat> in the schools, that's, it really doesn't reflect the true impact of the additional students because <clears throat> it's not just building capacity. The county pays a local supplement for each. Um, student, each additional student, and I think it's close to about forty, forty-five hundred, four thousand five hundred, or four thousand eight hundred dollars. Where's Keith? Uh, 
maybe Claudia knows, but we, we pay a local supplement for every student. So have you all ever discussed actually reflecting what the cost is to the county for rezonings and the educational impact? That, that is definitely something we can explore. I will tell you that the Durham Public Schools conversation has really picked up speed. We're in collaboration with them to update these numbers and the way we look at student generation ratios. Um, and I think a cost benefit is definitely something we could look at and explore as part of that purpose. Well, I would, I would request, I'm requesting um, that you do uh, take into account what the impact is on the actual cost of that impact of additional students that, you know, may or may not be um, acknowledged by the applicant in any way. Um, or the um, and similarly, I don't see it here, but often um, there is impact to services, I guess, when if it was going directly to the city, there would be an assessment of things like uh, fire service. Um, but do you all, I don't see anything here related to like EMS service or, I mean, even a building, if there is a commercial usage, there are going to be, for instance, there would could be the need for fire service. So I don't think I saw that in this report. Yeah, so we we don't generally look at fire service as it, during rezonings. There's already mechanism to provide service. Uh, if it's not being serviced by um, the city already, there's usually a mutual aid agreement uh, in place. Um, but it's not something that we explore in the rezoning process in terms of those service provisions. Um, in terms of the EMS, uh, they used to be a, a reviewer on the annexation petitions. Um, at one point, I think due to just some staffing shortages in terms of the uh, um, administrative part, they were not able to keep doing those, but that's definitely something that we could look back into for annexations. Uh, but for rezonings, we don't currently uh, have, we don't currently review that. Um, and I'm not sure, I would have to talk to Sarah Young to see how we'd approach that. Okay, well, I again, I would encourage there to be a reflection of all the costs to both the city and the county and the schools when we look at the impact of these um, developments. And I'll wait to ask more about, about the, um, to the applicant when he have the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I had two questions. The first is more just for my understanding. On section D where it says, while the residential element of the parcel could be rezoned to commercial general, CG allows for some residential development. Is that saying that commercial general allows for some types of residential development or that like on that land, some of it can be used for residential, but the rest has to be for commercial or both? Yeah, that's a great clarifying question. Thank you, Commissioner Lam. Uh, commercial general as a zoning district allows for some residential uses. Uh, specifically multifamily uses and more high density residential uses. So the full parcel or parcel of the land could be used for just that much. Correct. Use. Okay. And then my second question was more so along the lines of, of Commissioner Jacobs' comments and questions like the different types of analysis and summary that's done. One thing that just stood out that was interesting to me was under H, the adjacent and surrounding development, the proximity to amenities, the proximity to health care it was just interesting to me that you. it was noted for a oral surgery and orthodontic versus like, I would imagine you would want to look more into the proximity of regular healthcare versus such a specialized area. Absolutely. So that's a great observation. What you're seeing is that there isn't access to um, primary care physicians within the, you know, the vicinity. Um, and specialty care is all that's really around there. Um, you'd have to have a referral to go there. Okay. Yes, mine is relatively quick. Um, I, I know um, I have a lot of respect for you, Alexander, Mr. K. Here, I have a lot of respect for our planning commission. So, you know, I'm taking into advisement that they are saying twelve to zero. So I'm um, 
I'm I'm planning on voting in the affirmative, but you did make one note, and I know that this happens all the time in Durham. So we're moving something from residential to commercial, and we know that I think I read a report when you look at Mecklenburg County, when you look at Orange County, I mean uh, Guilford County and Wake County and Durham County, like 84 percent of all land is registered R1, so like residential one house, and you know we're there's only so much that we have. And I would never deny somebody the opportunity to bring in business. I sit up here and I harp on how much business we want to bring in. But I am interested to know, and this might have to be a question for the applicant. You stated that we don't know what's going there. Do we really not know what's going there, Mr. Cahill? Mr. Cahill really doesn't know what's going there, but the applicant might. Well, that's good. I'll, I'll, hit, I'll get the applicant later. You're, you're, you're off the hot seat with me, but I, I just always like to ask those questions because I want to know what's coming to the entire community. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I'm really glad um, Commissioner Alam asked. I had written that as one of my questions, too, about the uses. Um, could you tell us what are some of the uses that could, because there's no development plan, there's nothing, no development plan, there's no text-only development plan. Basically, what are all the things that could happen on this site, including, I guess, 104 residential units, but what, what else? Yeah, I, I'd be happy to pull up that list if you'd like. It is a long one, but a, a range or example of them. So anything commercial, this could be self-storage, this could be you know, any sorts of retail, pawn shops. I mean, it could be the range of literally anything commercial. Okay. Um, and I, I um, in Section K, just one other piece of feedback, because we don't normally get to have this opportunity. You, There are a lot of the scores where you give like, um, you know, walkability and things like that, and you have the average. But I'd be curious to know, like, what is the goal? Um, I didn't say anything there that gives context of, like, what are we aiming for or what do we consider as good? So, that, um, and I, I just will say before we hear that, I'm, I just, I have concerns about this from a process standpoint. I, I do. So. Mr. Carter? Uh, yes. And, and so when everyone else started having some concerns, and I, I felt like I was getting a deeper understanding of the report, and it raised a concern on my part as well related to the sustainability summary. It's really very empty, right? You know, like it, it's mostly we don't have any information on any of this, unavailable, uh, you know, that kind of thing. This will be determined at the site plan stage. So I guess my question is, um, where in the process would some of the, you know, the potential impact on stormwater control measures come into play? Um, and, it, and in particular, if a general CG, commercial general, um, would allow for a, a very large com multifamily complex, 104 units, that, you're right, that would be... A, a type of development that I would be concerned about what the impact on the water quality might be. And so what, when in the process does that happen? Yeah, thank you. Uh, and so hard to like see around, <laughs> Commissioner Carter. Uh, so you, you are seeing like a newer version of the staff report. Um, if you saw them in the past, they looked very different. And one of the reasons it says no information provided is because we don't have that information and we have that in there to kind of call out that when there is not a development plan present, we can't commit to things or the applicant can't commit to things in excess of the ordinance. Um, so that's kind of the first part to your question. The second part is uh, if, if there was a textual development plan, they could commit to more stringent stormwater requirements, sustainability measures, uh, the, whole, the whole slew of things that you're kind of speaking to. Um, if this general rezoning were approved tonight and there was no, you know, uh, additional work on some sort of text-only development plan. It would be at the site plan stage for any what development that came in um, that they would have to meet the ordinance requirements. So I believe that's a 10-year detention, 24-hour peak storm event for, um, for storm water for that specific example. So it would be at the site plan stage. That stage comes after the rezoning, and that is where there is no public hearing uh, component, and it's administratively approved staff. 
Well, so just trying to think this through, make sure I understand. And, and following up on what Wendy was saying, you know, if this had gone to the city for a rezoning, they might not have approved it because they'd be concerned about the impact on the water quality, as they have been with a number of other um, requested zoning changes or annexations, right? I mean, I mean is, am I making any sense? I'm looking at others to see if I'm making any sense. Um, I'm making sense to myself. How about to you? Am I making any sense to you? You are making great sense, yeah. I'm, we're not, I'm not used to getting this many questions. It's great. I love it. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that, that makes great sense, and that's something that I'll have to let the applicants speak to, you know, why they chose this route to go to the county instead of, you know, with a consolidated annexation to the city, um, and why there's no development plan. I will say that we can't require one, uh, but staff does advise in pre-submittal meetings, you know, you should consider some sort of development plan because you can commit to additional some of our, commitments some of our and access to the ordinance. may be able to be answered by the applicant if we will, you'll. Hold up a minute and let's get the app. Absolutely. I have one question for staff still. Let's bring the staff back. Let's get the applicant to, uh, then we can bring the staff back. But let me open the public hearing uh, first. I'll open the public hearing and now we can hear from the applicant. And as you can say, we all have questions about what's going to go there. So can you shed some light on what's your plan? Thank you, Chair Howerton and Commissioners. My name is Randy Herman. I'm an attorney with the law firm of BA Folk, and I represent the applicant, Anna Neal Blanchard. Um, the first thing I would say is if you look at the map, the current zoning map, I believe would be in the staff report. Um, this property is about three acres. Um, almost uh, more than two acres of it is already zoned commercial general. Um, the point that sticks up uh, away from 70 is the part that is currently zoned rural residential. Um, I've been able, unable to figure out why that is. It's just an old legacy zoning. Um, and as you can see, all the surrounding parcels are already zoned commercial general. Um, my client is not a developer. She's an individual. She inherited this property from her parents. Um, and she is not planning on developing it herself. Uh, it's also probably not developable on its own um, because it's weirdly shaped and also because most of it is along 70, and we know that at some point 70 is going to be widened there, uh, and probably a lot of that property that is already zoned commercial general is going to be taken for that uh, widening. Um, so the goal here is to rezone that part that is sticking up to commercial general um, and combine this parcel with some of the surrounding parcels that eventually that whole intersect develop. Um, that is the reason why it is where it is, um, because my, uh, again, my client is not planning to develop it herself. Uh, and when we try, we initially submitted for rezoning with the city, rezoning and annexation together. Um, but because we don't have any current plans to develop, we don't know what's going to go there. Uh, we couldn't provide them enough information that the city could analyze it for annexation. Um, and so, therefore, we made the decision to rezone under the county's jurisdiction. Um, so, at some point in the future, when it is ready to be developed, it will need to be annexed into the city. Um, that will be a whole separate process that the city will have to review and vote on. Um, and that is where we expect a lot of this analysis in terms of um, stormwater and also in terms of water and sewer and all of that uh, will occur. Um, because it, it basically will not be developed under the county's jurisdiction. Uh, so I hope that answers some of the, some of the questions. Um, uh, we had um, several uh, neighborhood meetings on this property because we had to do one under the initial submission under the city. We had to do another one for the county. Uh, we had no neighbors attend any of those meetings. Um, if you look at the comments on um, the, the city county planning website where you can uh, make comments about properties, all the comments about this intersection are that it's not appropriate for residential and it should be developed for commercial. Um, and also on the long range plan, it's intended for commercial use. So I do feel like we are trying to follow what the city and the county have provided in terms of guidance and also what the, the neighbors have provided in terms of guidance. 
in terms of what they want to see on this property. Um, my client is in talks with a couple of the neighboring property owners, probably sell the property to them. Um, but we just don't know at this point uh, what it actually will be developed as, other than that it'll be a, a commercial. Uh, I hope that covered anything. If I forgot any of your questions, please let me know. Were there any anyone on the on Zoom that asked any questions? No, ma'am. No one has signed up, and no one has their hand raised. I, I will just say it, that does help clarify some of uh, my concern. I am looking at the flu map and the area map now. So this rezoning, from what I can tell, is really just to make it consistent with the entirety of the property as the majority of it is currently commercial. Yeah, that's pretty much, it's just to rationalize the zoning. So that, but, so that makes sense. Zone. Okay. And that, I, I, I'm, I'm, that answers my question. I appreciate you. Thank you. Anything else for the applicant? Close the public hearing. Bring it back to the board. And if you have any other questions for staff at this point. I have, um, yes, I have one uh, question for staff just following up to that. Sorry, bringing you up again. Um, I'm just interested, and in, you can even provide this later on. Why is it that the city requires... Uh, knowing what the rezoning is going to be used for versus the county doesn't require uh, knowing that. And then if that were to change, what would that be going through the UDO and Planning Commission or changes? Yeah, the, again, that's a great question and uh, opportunity to clarify. The city and county planning functions are essentially the same. It's the same, you know, one department. Yeah. There's not a requirement that we know it's built. We can't actually require that per state statute. Um, that's what a general rezoning is, which is this. Um, so it'd be the same in the city or the county. Um, I think what um, uh, uh, Mr. Herman was speaking to is the annexation portion. Mm -hmm. And in the annexations, the city code, not the unified development ordinance, but the city code specifically speaks to a cost-benefit analysis and a service operation analysis has to be done before an annexation is accepted that help clarify? Yeah, that's very helpful. All right. Thank you. Mr. Jacobs? Um, so just to clarify, you're saying that if to go through the city, you'd have to do a rezoning and the annexation at the same time. That's correct. Okay. And here, you just have to do the rezoning. Okay. I, I, I mean, I will vote for it, but I just... For me, I just the process doesn't really feel great. Because even though we're saying commercial, really any, it, it's just, it's a very broad, it's a very, very broad um, category. So I, I don't feel 100% great on it, but thank you. So are there are no other questions? Commissioners of motions on this one well the language um uh, madam chair i'd like to make a motion to adopt an ordinance amending the unified development ordinance by taking property out of residential rule and commercial general on falls jordan mom yes um and establishing the same as commercial general on falls jordan uh f j uh b Second. Second. Been moved and properly second. All in favor? Aye. Complete. And then we have a motion to. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a second motion on this public hearing to adopt the appropriate state of consistency pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 160D 605. Second. Been moved and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. It passes five to zero. We are down to twenty-three zero one nine eight. 
um, this is a public hearing to adopt the resolution related to not exceed $235 million limited on series 203A and 203B. The board is requesting to hold a public hearing on the negotiation of amendment to installment finance contracting of not dollars limited off the bonds and the related project to be financed and refinanced thereby. So have Susan, mm -hmm. you speak on this topic. Yes, um, just to give you a brief overview. If you remember, we came on the 27th for the financing calendar for this financing, and the board approved the initial resolution and set the public hearing for tonight. And so the next step in the phase to complete this debt issuance for long-term fixed rate um, is to um, hold the public hearing this evening and then adopt the final resolution. Questions? Carter? Yes. So what's the actual be it resolved? Like, you know, what are, what are we resolving to do? Well, the, the resolution is doing several things. It's discussing what the next supplemental agreement amendment to the um, initial 2009 original financing. Um, so it describes the projects that are included in that supplemental agreement, which makes up $235 million. There's also authorizations. You're, um, you're announcing who authorized officers are to conduct this um, financing on the county's behalf. And you're authorizing the execution of certain legal documents. Um, you're authorizing the um, county manager, the CFO, the assistant CFO, um, as far as any proceedings that need to take place to ensure the successful financing. You're authorizing the county attorney to provide legal advice um, when needed, warranted. So it's, it's, it's the team. It's the process. That's great. Thank you. And copies of all the documents uh, referenced in the resolution are with our clerk, our chief financial officer, and can be made available to any board member. Class. Uh, Susan, just to uh, cancel, Ms. Tease, our CFO, <laughs> put some respect on your name for Women's History Month. <laughs> Um, I, I just, you know, for anybody who might be watching, you know, the, the, Madam Chair did point out that some of the documentation was there, but this really is going a long way to pay for and provide debt service for um, a lot of infrastructure investments we're making. Uh, we purchased, make, make sure I keep me honest here, the property that we purchased for Durham Tech, right, for that expansion, mm -hmm. the shops at Hope Valley that we purchased, That's $108 million, you know, just for Durham Public Schools. Um, the um, the new pump station, the investment that we're making with the Research Triangle Park Foundation. So these are really, you know, our infrastructural investments, our dollars, where the vote for um, our, where, where the vote for our, what's the word I want to use, where our bonds and our lobs went. So maybe that is also what it resolves, correct? That we are That's moving correct. forward with these projects. So, so the I know we're throwing finance. numbers out there. I want to throw ideas and examples out there. Exactly. So, can see. so what this is financing is over 86 million in governmental projects. Right. That includes like the Northern Convenience Site, the New Youth Home, uh, Snow Hill Road Pump Station, RTF, that agreement we have with RTF to provide a portion of funding out there. Um, of course, the DTCC per, per, uh, property purchase. And then um, the shops at Hope Valley. Because um, I believe I stated in the previous meeting, the LGC likes if you've got a fixed cost yep. and you know what that number is, that they prefer that you fix it out over long term mm -hmm. versus short term. So we knew what that acquisition price was going to be. Um, so we included that this time. And then you've got um, over $108 million for Durham Public Schools. And then you're going to have, of course, reimbursement of expenses, which is your debt issuance cost. And then, of course, with the taxable 
And Susan, all of that is outlined in the, in our document. Yes, ma'am. Online. Um, and it's also outlined. Um, they're included in the supplemental document that's right. attached to the agenda item. And then, the, of course, the 300 block, what we have financed so far, we're going to take that one completely out as well. So, yes, there's a lot of different projects, a lot of good coming from it. And this is also, if you recall, um, Durham County has been doing this particular type of financing since about 2000, where we issue short-term variable rate up front. We pay the cost up front. We reimburse ourselves upon after it cost. And then over a short period of time, 24 to 36 months, we take that out and fix it with fixed rate long-term debt. So this is how we've been doing it for quite some time now, because it is more cost efficient for the county. Thank you for helping us be smart with our money. Susan, thank you so much for that analysis and report, especially for the public to understand what it is that, um, that this money is for. This phone won't ring. Yes, and a very small portion is where we're, um, if, we, if when the time we go to market is going to prevent sufficient savings, then we will also refinance the 2012 and 2013 LOBs. But we won't know if that's going to be beneficial for the county until that day. So that, that's included in the not to exceed amount, just in case, which is about $16 million. No, it might be $12 million now. Somewhere, somewhere between $12 and $15, $16 million. Thank you. Any other questions? Go to Monica. All right. Um, I'd like to report to the board that notice of a public hearing relating to financing the projects described uh, in pursuant to an amendment to an installment financing contract and a principal amount not to exceed $235 million on March 23rd, 2023, stating that the board would hold a public hearing thereon on March 13th, 2023. The board will now hear anyone who wishes to be heard on this question of the proposed amendment to the contract and the project to be financed and refinanced thereby. This time, I will open the public hearing. Chair Howerton, we have not had anyone signed up to speak, nor do we have anyone online. Thereby, I will, hearing no sign, no one signed up to speak. I will close the public hearing and entertain a motion. Um, have a motion to close the public hearing. Yes. Motion to close. The so, so according to script for the bond, we have to open. We have to have a motion to open and close the public. Hearing. I said. <laughs> so to, to clarify, did we have a, we didn't okay. do a motion to open? Okay, commissioners, I need a motion. So I make a motion to open the public hearing. Thank you. Hearing. We got to do that first. Okay. A motion to open. Second. I need a second. Second. I did the second. She got a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And no one signed up to speak. So now I need a motion. To close the public hearing. I move to close the public hearing, Madam Chair. Second. Okay. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Now a resolution entitled Resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the County of Durham, North Carolina, approving an amendment to the ins installment purchase contract and related matters is before the board for consideration authorizing staff to move forward as county representatives with the proposed financing and refinancing of the project we just discussed and organize and authorizing the execution and delivery of certain documents in connection with this financing is there a motion to adopt this resolution Madam Chair, I uh, move to that we adopt the resolution as stated. Second. It's been moved and probably second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, next item is 23-0143, Department of Social Services update child welfare placement protocol and guidelines. So the board is requested to hear uh, from DSS on the updated protocols for placement of children with medically complex needs. And we have Sarah Bradshaw from DSS Director and Javetta Whitfield, DSS Assistant, to discuss this item. Good evening, Madam Chair and Vice Chair and all board members assembled. I thank you for allowing the department to come before you tonight to update you on some protocols that we have for placement of children um, with medically complex needs. So just to state, Durham County recognizes the importance of children maintaining fam familial and community connections. We, we place high priority in doing so. And we also place high priority in looking for non-institutional settings when, where they can live in a family-like community-based setting. Congregate care facilities are usually our last resort. So Durham has, um, we have, what we've done is updated our protocols to speak specifically in more detail about medically complex children, just because that is a rise of our population um, in the last year or two. And so it outlines um, the steps that we will take to first see non-institutional settings, asking relative if they will, um, will or are willing and able to care for medically complex needs children. And if not, then we will look for, again, non-institutional settings such as our family resources, parents, um, and then go from there. We will always seek the best interest for our children when they are placed in our care um, and make sure that their health and well-being needs can be met in any setting that they are placed. Um, in doing so, we also realize that we need to be more specific in our recruitment efforts and trying to locate resource families who will take medically complex needs children. It is a challenge for us because it is a population that is hard and takes a lot of commitment um, for one to, to care for. But we have updated our recruitment and retention policy um, with input from resource parents who are sit on our commitment, our committee, um, staff, and, and also um, birth parents. Just to say, what do we need to do? How can we recruit resource parents to take the medically complex needs children? So those are some of the changes that we have made in the last three to four months. Um, as we continue to review all our policies and as our needs of our children. Um, in addition, we updated our um, enhanced care rate that we have had in place since about the early 2000s. Um, but as the standard board rate increased, so did our enhanced rate. It also increased. Um, and so we had to reflect that in a policy that we had that was separate. It wasn't all one document, and we've combined all our placement and recruitment efforts of um, medical complex needs children as well as just traditional children in one program. We have one person signed up to be um, Elizabeth Simpson. You have three minutes. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Simpson. I reside at 1809 Glendale Avenue in Durham, and I'm appearing today on behalf of my employer, Emancipate NC. Um, I'm here to speak on the updated protocol for children with disabilities in DSS custody that we just heard from a representative of DSS. I would be interested for the record for that person to state her name. Um, this protocol is meant to ensure that children are not needlessly institutionalized, but instead have every opportunity to be taken care of in a home setting. Um, I made a public records request on Friday for the settlement agreement for the lawsuit that that change is connected to. 
I find it surprising that the agenda did not mention that this was related to litigation, a lawsuit against the Department of Social Services in Durham County, that our presentation did not mention the lawsuit, and instead acted as though this was a change that was spontaneous and without instigation from the community. Um, the lack of transparency that DSS has shown this community is really astounding. Um, lack of forthrightness in, in everything that I've seen, I don't know what all everyone else is seeing. Um, earlier this fall, I presented a report to you all that Emancipate NC wrote based on interviews with stakeholders in the community. More than 20 stakeholders, many who are afraid to speak out about DSS, they wanted confidentiality. And when I came to DSS, when I came to Commissioner Jacobs to ask us speak with you all about these recommendations for very reasonable reforms, to DSS, people refuse to speak. They refuse to have conversations about policies, not about specific cases, but about policies that affect the entire community. I filed a public records lawsuit because I made a public records request for very simple data. How many children are in care in Durham County? What are the demographics? Race, gender, medical needs. And I was told there were no records. But somehow when I filed a lawsuit, two weeks later there were many records. DSS board was not publishing their minutes on their website throughout the year of 2022 until that public records lawsuit was filed. I tried to file petitions on behalf of a client a few weeks ago, and DSS instructed the clerk of court not to file those petitions. That is obstruction of justice. <sighs> Government agencies that operate without transparency, without oversight, without sunlight, are prone to corruption. In this case, a child, a newborn, was institutionalized needlessly when their parents wanted to take care of them at home and could have with proper support from Medicaid within home services. And that's not mentioned anywhere in this update. It was an institution, a private institution, being paid with public tax dollars that was profiting off the pain of that family. Thank you. If you have some notes that you'd like to leave with the clerk, feel free to do that. Are there, were there any questions from the board? Hearing none. Ricardo? I actually have one question. Thank you, Javetta, for um, bringing this forward and explaining it to us. Um, my question is related to a meeting that I attended for Alliance Board of Health where they were actually discussing network adequacy for placement of children in foster care and just in general how there are you know a fair, fair number of challenges. Um, we hear about children having to spend the night in the offices and such because it's difficult to find placement. And one of the um, issues that was raised as an, an, an additional uh, challenge, I guess, to finding the resource parents that you mentioned um, was a requirement that the family had to work. And the reason that was difficult was because th these children are medically fragile, vulnerable, and require many doctor appointments, perhaps. And um, the woman explaining this just said that they had had family members that had to, you know, withdraw because they couldn't miss work you know, in order to take the children to their appointment. So I'm just wondering, is that a, is that a law? Do we have any control over that? Is, um, is, that even, is that even relevant here? It feels like it might be. I'm not sure exactly how to answer your question because it's loaded. Um, oh, in that I, mean, we I didn't mean to load it. We don't a lot of things that occur. Um, we do, we're not the medical professionals, so we don't make the medical recommendations. My question is, in order to be a resource parent, do you, is it a requirement that you have to work? In order to be a resource parent, you have to be able to maintain your own expenses without relying on the stipend that the um, state provides. So and, if they're retired and can maintain their own finances, and yes, you are capable and able to. When I was at this alliance meeting, it just made me wonder if there were a different law, maybe it would be less challenging to find resources to families, but that is a law, right? It's not a local decision? 
I won't say it's part of the policy for the, the Department of Health and Human Services on resources. All right, thank you. And I didn't mean to load you, load you, give you a loaded question. <laughs> thank you, Javetta, for your report. I did have one quick one for Janetta. And look, it's, I promise you it won't be loaded. Um, I, I'm, it's, it's more of a curiosity because I did take the time to read all, you know, read the seven pages, and I appreciate the steps in which our staff has to go through. Um, I can't think about some of our employees, especially during COVID, that had to sleep in the building when we had, we had medically complex children. Their parents had just left, you know, for lack of a better phrase. So it's not always mental issues. There are issues with COVID, HIV. There, there's a lot. And so, one, I know about the sacrifice that your staff made over the two years. I, I, I've seen it myself. Uh, Low Siler, God rest his soul, you know, talked about it a lot. My question is, in working with um, our hospitals, uh, especially, I don't know where that is in here, how are we working to make sure that, I, I'm going to use a, an example about somebody who, a child now who might just be going through a mental break. And this might be a parent who says, you know what, I don't know what else to do. I, does Duke Hospital go through this same framework? Because maybe it's not always a parent that is bringing us a medically complex child. And it could be or another hot wake med or anybody else. So is the, pro, pro, is the protocol the same for our medical institutions or somewhat different? I'm not sure what their, their internal protocol is. Right. I know that they will call us if they know that a child is maybe dependent or um, and we'll take the port and screen it. Mm -hmm. um, but Alliance is also a support to the hospital as a referral and information about possible placements. Some of that is more therapeutic needs. Right. Um, and that's what Alliance Health will be able to assist them with. Thank you so much. I appreciate all that you do. Thanks, Javetta. Okay. Uh, yeah, there, is there any other business matters to or hearing none? I will entertain motion to adjourn. Unless you'd like to so moved. <laughs> <laughs> if you want, unless you want to stay. <laughs> Second. Did I hear most? You heard, yeah. Moved in. Okay. So, all in favor? Aye. All right. We are adjourned.